Well, I'm calling this one random beneficial principles. And uh, there's just sometimes I pull together little thoughts from some of the uh, pictures I've taken over the years about you know stuff I want to share and ideas that I have about uh, how we can do things a little better, how we can learn things a little better, how we can be a little clearer with uh, our thinking process and all that. And one of the things I had to deal with whenever I was uh, working with students every day was I had to be sure, you know, one of the things you do is you have to teach the basic principles and then you've got to get them to apply what they've learned, uh, say it with you, do it with you and all that. you got to show them, you got to make sure they're paying attention and then you turn them loose to make sure that they can perform uh, in the, whatever it is you've trained them to do. That's the testing phase and all that. Uh, and if there's the, the problem with having to train to a particular test is that you may wind up only teaching them the stuff they need to pass the test instead of actually teaching them what they really need to know. And the real test is how they're going to perform when they get out there working in a shop somewhere or doing whatever it is you're training them to do. I built these little training aids, uh, you know, myself, kind of because I enjoyed building them. On the other hand, uh, some of the training aids that I see are, are really good and they're very well made and they're also very expensive. And I was thinking, you know, I'm looking bang for my buck. What can I teach these people with the resources that I have that won't cost a fortune and wipe out my budget? Now, I know there's Perkins money and all that. Uh, but this keyless entry exercise board, I actually had the little buttons here where you could punch in the right code, you know, the little codes on that sticker. Uh, and then I had the relays here and I had a little... Uh, the, I actually used a little power window motor that would go back and forth if they would... Uh, you know, got it wired up right. But uh, like I say, I always like to teach them how to wire the doggone thing up. You know, there were some other boards that have them wired together over here too. Uh, and so this would basically enable them to understand this particular keyless entry system. And I got this stuff off of an old junk car, except for the project box and the buttons, which I bought from Radio Shack and the jumper wires and all that. If it's already wired up, and all they have to do is watch it work, they really haven't learned as much as they're going to learn if they have to wire it up and make it work. And then if it doesn't work right, some of the jumper wires may be bad, and that's routine with these cheap jumper wires. But if it doesn't work right, they're supposed to get their test light or their meter or whatever they decide to use, and they're supposed to check all the powers and grounds and all the intermediate connections and all that kind of stuff. It works really good because they understand it so much better than they do if you've got something like a cutaway engine, yeah, you can probably use your laser pointer and you can point to this, that, and look at what those valves are doing and look at what these gears are doing and all that. But typically, the way students are nowadays, what they're going to say is, okay, yeah, I see this right here and it's really attractive, but what do I do after five minutes of looking at it? What's next? You know, they want to learn more uh, than what that particular thing is going to teach them. And I've shown this before. That's, that, that's this guy working on that fuel injection board over there. He had to wire all of that up. He didn't wire all of it up right. The engine controller, the injectors, and all that. He didn't wire that up right. And even the, the scan tool port down there where you plug the scan tool in. All that had to be wired right for it to work right. And it was real easy to tell if they did it right or if they didn't. And uh, this was a little power supply that I had here for that little fan board. And this right here was the final exam where I basically had this board. It was a relay circuit they had to troubleshoot. I had a bad relay I'd put in there sometimes. Or I could push one of these bug buttons, which you can't tell if it's down or up, and all the wires are the same color, and I would basically insert faults in that board. That was something I created for that uh, Skills USA uh, local competition thing one of the time. This other one, they had to build a circuit, and then they had to do everything that you can do with a meter. They had to measure vo available voltage, voltage drop, they had to measure the resistor, they had to measure voltage drop across the resistor across the entire circuit. They had to explain why it is that the resistance of the bulb increased so dramatically whenever you're using the, uh, uh, whenever you're calculating the resistance of the bulb when it's burning, you know, based on the current, the voltage, and then you compare that to the resistance of the bulb when it's not burning. They had to explain why it was that the bulb had like, you know, a lot more ohms of resistance, six or seven ohms of resistance whenever it was burning and only one and a half or 1.2 when it wasn't and all that. And so all of this stuff is how I would uh, drill that in, you know, basically. Now, if you solder these battery terminals on, if you're going to use this kind right here, now, 
This is not a lead battery terminal. This battery terminal is colored to look like lead, but it's actually brass. And so, and it's like, uh, it's cast brass is what it is. So if you, you know, get too aggressive with it and you tighten it up too much or abuse it, you can actually pop the terminal right here, it'll break. But in order to do that, you've got to get your wire ready and the ground, the secondary ground or whatever. You're going to use your bottle torch to heat the terminal from the side while you're feeding rosin core solder in there. It's best to use the, you know, the fatter rosin core solder. Don't use acid core solder because it'll ruin everything. Don't go there. That's for, you know, soldering radiator, brass radiator tanks and stuff like that. Rosin core solder, feed it into the terminal. You're going to make a molten cauldron of solder out of this. And after that, you'll, you'll, it'll have a bunch of rosin floating on top of it, and it will basically be molten solder down in there. And then we're using your glove, you got to have your safety glasses on, by the way, and you're going to shove that down in there and hold it for a second with your gloved hand. And I'd like to you know, use cloth or leather gloves, not the natural ones. You know, something that will protect your hands from the heat, in other words. Okay, so you shove that down in there, and you hold it for about 30 or 40 seconds, and it will get... It will, all that heat will go into that copper and that solder will grab that copper like you can't believe. And if you want to be a belt and suspenders guy, you can slide a piece of shrink tubing over it and it makes it look really professional. And uh, this is what it used to look like and this is what it looked like. You know, this is the same, this is what we, what way it was when we started. See how these connections? That's okay, but you're going to start having some issues there and it just looks terrible and it's not professional at all. But if you put one of these on there, and you put a piece of shrink tubing on it, you know, you actually already have all of those grounds fed in there with this instead of having them outside. I don't know how many times we've gone in there and done that. Uh, my shop foreman was a stickler for battery terminals, and he'd say he'd rather give the people a battery terminal cleaning than have it come back on him because of something the battery terminals caused later, you know. It was a, we actually had, a, there was a, a, a program where there was, you know, the, the problem with batteries boiling over in the engine compartment and getting acid all over everything was a real one because of engine compartment heat heating the batteries up. That's why a lot of the batteries have got bubble wrap or they got a battery a housing over them so that they won't get as hot and they won't boil over as bad. Uh, they, we had a recall where we had to put those on Explorers. We also uh, had one where on some of the F-150s we had to actually, the battery tray had become so rusty that they wanted us to pull the battery out of there and clean that battery tray and paint it with some primer. You know, this was something that they had us doing, you know, that didn't cost the customer anything. They just, you know, called them in on a, on a program to get them done like that. All right. Now, these right here are pretty cool. You can buy these for uh, this little thing. For Amazon's got about $10. That is solder with rosin in the middle of it, and it will fit right down in that battery terminal. Uh, you know, where you're uh, going to poke the wire, and you can put that in there and you can heat that up with a bottle torch, and this will turn into a liquid cauldron of solder, and that works pretty good too. I mean, that's really a pretty, and these don't cost much, these cost about a dollar a piece. You know, now the terminals are fairly expensive, but the up and coming thing is terminals like this, where you basically prepare your wire and you crimp it around, crimp this around the wire, you know, that's like a big old terminal you got to use some good strong uh, pliers to crimp that good and solid around there. Then you heat that up with your bottle torch and you feed solder in there until this is soldered to that copper. If you just bend that copper around there to begin with, it's going to get loose and pull out. Secondly, the solder is going to make a lot better joint than having that, uh, you know, just having that crimped and all that. A, a crimp is by itself, uh, even on some of your smaller terminals, is, is not all that great. Furthermore, if you got solder, there's not any corrosion that's going to be able to wick in there and get in between the copper wires and this terminal and cause voltage drop issues. And so that's a little thing right there. All right, who recognizes this engine? Now, if you're looking at an engine and you've been where I've been, this vaguely looks like a 3-liter engine and like a 90 or 91 Eagle Premier, uh, you know, like a... a Jeep Eagle used to make a long time ago, Americanized R25 Renault. That's not what this engine is. This engine right here is the engine for a DeLorean. A little V6 and it's mounted in the back. And the one that I was talking about has got that K-Jetronic fuel injection on it. And that's what it looks like under the back, you know. Uh, and it's pretty interesting there, DeLorean Motor Company. And there's your little fuel distributor I was talking about on that K-Jetronic stuff. And the funky thing on this, on a previous video, I talked about how the 
distributor cap. You know, the, the uh, distributor towers are in little closely, um, they're, they're clustered so that there's two, three sets of two with spaces in between each pair. Uh, just because of the fact that they didn't display the crank journals and all that. But anyway, that's another story. That's your cold start injector right there, I believe. And the long and the short of it is, there's a heck of a lot of this. See, this didn't work exactly like the other one. Now, I could be wrong about that. Uh, but this is a strange system anyway. I worked on this one, um, and my buddy Donnie worked on it. I, he actually bought this car, and he still owns it. But the fact was, he, it was not running quite right, and what he discovered was that the uh, fuel hose coming out of the fuel tank uh, had... Uh, deteriorated on the inside and it had shrunk down to where there was almost no fuel able to pass through it at all. And when he replaced that fuel line, that was a, a big part of what was wrong with this. It couldn't get fuel from the tank and the hose looked normal on the outside. That was an interesting thing right there. Now I was, had these students here. Uh, this is not the vehicle I'm talking about. They were working on a Taurus uh, that belonged to one of the uh, other students in there that didn't have quite as much experience. And these two guys right here uh, the first time they pulled the transmission out of that Taurus uh, to work on it, uh, it took them about a day or a little more than a day to get the transmission out. And they, they pulled it out, they worked on it, they put it back, they pulled it out, they worked on it, they put it back. I bet they pulled that thing out of there five or six times. Well, the last time they had to pull it out was to correct one simple little mistake that they had made putting it together that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, had something to do with the... Uh, with the main valve in there it was not connected to the shift linkage or something. Anyway, they had to pull the transmission back out and straighten that out. The last time they pulled that thing out, uh, it didn't even take them. It took them less than an hour to get it on the bench, and it took them less than an hour to pop it back in there because they had got so good at it. If you do a job over and over again, you get really good at it, and that's what happened to these guys right here. And they got that Taurus transmission working like brand new after they you know, did all the work on it. But they, that was a learning process, you know. I was talking to that one transmission shop one time about that, about a vehicle that we were working on. We kept having to pull the transmission out of And this was a transmission shop. All the guy did was transmission work. He was really good at it. He'd been in it for 40 years. And he was talking to his guy. He says, the problem they're having sounds like the one we had to pull the transmission out of 10 times. You remember that? <laughs> and I was thinking, well, it's good to know that, not, you know, that uh, other people sometimes had to pull the transmission out several times. You know, transmissions are aggravating too. It takes a special kind of a person to be able to do uh, transmissions and nothing else, you know. Uh, my boy Jimmy that works over there that I put back in the mid-2000s at the, at the Ford place over there, he can do transmissions or electronics or fuel injection. It don't matter what it is, he can do it, and he can do it really good and really fast. Uh, but, and he's like, a, he's like what you'd call a renaissance man when it comes to fixing stuff like, you know, anything that comes in. And it doesn't matter if it's a Duramax or if it's a Hyundai or if it's Ford, what it is, he can fix anything, you know. All right, understanding backlash was something I always struggle with my students. I would show them this. I try to explain. We're looking to measure the amount of clearance that you have between this gear and the pinion gear in the front. Okay, so you want to make sure it's not too tight. You want to make sure it's not too loose. You know, the backlash specs are typically listed in there, and, you, and there's you know going to be like 12, 15, 20 thousand. I don't remember, but anyhow, that's. Whenever you rock it back and forth, that dial indicator is going to show you. you got This is not a perfect angle, but it's really close to vertical on that thing. And um, so what you do is you you got to have you know have the drive shaft locked where it won't move. And then you also got to move it so this moves uh, only as much as it's allowed to. And that gives you your backlash reading. I would teach them that. And the, a week later, I'd go out there and say, demonstrate to me how you measure backlash. And they were just totally clueless. They put the thing on this way. They put it that way. They put it. They just put it every kind of way except for what I was wanting to see. Uh, you know that's so I was. That was something that I would struggle to teach these guys. You know, but you know, there's uh, once you get it down pat and you understand what you're measuring. And you know, sometimes I wondered if if it was the way I was teaching it or if they just weren't listening or what the deal was. Because sometimes, as I've said before, sometimes a student will look at you and nod their head. Like they're hearing everything you're saying and they're understanding, but if you don't get them to explain it back to you or demonstrate it themselves, they'll forget it. And reading a micrometer, I would actually teach them how to read a mic. I'd have them measure several things and write it down. I'd say, no, that's wrong, that's right, that's wrong. And I'd say, okay, do this, and I'd make sure they had it. You know, this is it. You understand how to read a mic now? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, so then 
they would, uh, about a week later, if they had to measure something when they were doing a job in the shop, they'd come over there with a micrometer and says, can you walk me through this again? I forgot how to read it. And I was, and I was telling them, I said, you know, how, you know how I learned how to read a mic? And I'm talking about an imperial mic. Uh, and they, they said, no, who taught you how to read a mic? I said, nobody taught me how to read a mic. I saw one on the tool truck one day, a zero to one inch mic. And I said, uh, how much is that mic? And he said, 15 bucks. So I gave him 15 bucks. I took the mic and I stood there at my toolbox for two and a half minutes. And I said, oh, this is easy to read. And I, that was the mic I used from then on out. I mean, that was the method I used to read the mic, and I taught other I taught the students that, and it seemed like for some reason they had trouble burning that in. I was, I was confused about that too. Now, the benefits of back probing is that if you're careful and you use the right kind of tools, you can buy these online, back probing tools, look them up, and heck, you can get them on Amazon. And when you back probe, you're not breaching the insulation on the wire, typically. You're going in there, and in a, in a perfect world, you'll be resting with that thing against the terminal. And the funny thing about that, there was this, uh, I think it was an 06 charger that one of my students had. And whenever he would turn, it would stumble and fall on its face sometimes. And so I said, well, we're going to find out what's going on. And so we went down there to his engine controller and we back probed the, kink, the crank and the cam sensor and a couple of other things. And uh, as long as we had our scope connected to that thing, we were watching it while he was driving, it would never, 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 never act up. But when we removed our back probe, it started stumbling again. But when we had it back probe, it wouldn't. And what I found out was, when we were back probing it, we were putting a little tension on the terminal, and it was, you know, we had a pin fit issue with the engine controller, and it was causing the terminals to actually touch and give a better signal and when they were dancing around loose, you know, heating up and cooling off and all that kind of thing. And, and if we, as a matter of fact, we got some straight pins and we just left some back probes in there just for him to, you know, try it. And as long as those pins were stuck in the crank in the cam sensor, uh, back probe kind of like you see right here, you didn't have, uh, he didn't have any of those problems. But when you pull those pins out, he did. So that told us right then that where the pin was fitting between the harness and the engine controller, those things needed to be tweaked, and that was how we dealt with that. That was on like a 06 Dodge Charger or whatever. <clears throat> but you know, it's really irritating. And there was a this uh, some of this equipment that we would use on some of the uh, the Ford vehicles back when I was at the dealer, where we'd plug up plug in between the harness and the engine controller, and we go looking for a problem. And as long as we had the engine controller, you know, the breakout harness on there, even the breakout box, or whether it was the service bay diagnostic system or some of the other tools on some of the older engine controllers. Sometimes when you put the tool in there, the problem would go away. And then when you took it out and you plugged it back in, you'd have the problem back. So you basically needed your, uh, you know, you were trying to take readings off of something that you couldn't read without hooking up to it somehow. Um, now there are these picks that you can actually get that will bite right into the wire, right? You now they claim, oh, that's the kiss of death, that's horrible, that corrosion will get in there, it'll ruin the whole car, and it'll set fire to the world, and all that kind of stuff. There are some little, you know, this little liquid tape that you can buy. You can buy this little uh, this little liquid tape that gets black, rubbery stuff with a brush, and you can go back in there, and you can brush over that place where you pierce the wire with your little, you know, prick tool to get in there to take your reading. Sometimes taking the readings with the prick tool is the best way to do it, uh, and that's just the way that is. All right. Almost never done anymore is replacing these boots. Now you can buy these boots all day long for like twenty-one dollars on Amazon, and they look really good. The split boots that they have you glue in together with super glue, you know, where you put them on there and glue them—that's just those are a joke. I don't know if I've ever seen those work. Somebody else might have had good luck with them or be better at putting them on there than I am. But for years, when I was working at a Volkswagen dealer back in the early '80s, part of what we would do is we would take the CV joints apart and we would, you know, take them off the end of the CV axle. We would clean them out really, really good. We would pack them with grease and we'd put new boots on them. I mean, that was something that, you know, people don't do that much anymore. Typically, you know, they put a little, a little ring in there. Usually that one's not as robust as the one that comes on the tip end of the axle shaft anyway. Uh, you know, some of them would have one of those. A lot of the times, though, if it's got one of those on there, you just... You know, tilt the thing sideways and you whack it with a hammer and it pops off of there. I used to have my students take CV joints apart and put them back together, which is really tricky. Uh, and it's doable. I mean, you got to think about it. They were put together the first time by somebody. 
and you know they basically you got to roll it around pop those balls out of there and all that kind of stuff and I'd have them lay all the parts out on the bench and put them all back together you know just so they'd understand how they work and inspect them to see if they had any little dimples in there it was making them go clickety clickety click when you was turning and all that however when I was pointing out here <clears throat> look at the price for CV axle on some of these this is on a, this is on a Honda I looked this up on twenty dollars for a car quest really these are these may be remanufactured now, that says eBay there Amazon fifty bucks a1 Cardone, 41 Now, this is not going to be the same price for every car you look them up on, obviously. But the simple fact is, in a lot of cases, in most cases, it makes more sense to go ahead and get a whole axle shaft and put in there instead of just replacing that boot. Uh, just, you know, do whatever you decide you want to do. Uh, but if you are going to replace that boot, you and while you've got that thing taken apart, you need to wash all that grease out of there. Go ahead and take those... Uh, you know, pop those balls out of there one at a time. You got to tilt it to do that and all that. And this is the outer joints I'm talking about. And look really good and see if it's brindled in there where the balls ride or anything. Because if you if you put that boot on there, even if you pack it full of grease and it's got you know little dimples, those balls has to walk in and out of when you're turning. You're still gonna hear that clickety clickety click noise, and you're not gonna be any better off. However, when that boot gets first first gets ruptured. If it, it loses its grease when their water and dirt gets up in there, and it's going to wear that CV joint out really, really fast. So if you see one of those is just starting to leak and there's not any noise being made on a joint. I've seen Toyota ones that didn't have enough grease in them when they were built. And they wore out and started clicking even though the boot was intact. So that's part, that's part of the deal too. Blower resistor issues have always been interesting to me. If leaves and stuff gets down here around the blower resistor, see these little uh, resistor wires get really hot when it's running on low. They put this thing in the airflow so that it's blowing air across this, keeping it cool. And you might notice you that piece right there is hard to see. That's this right here. See that little fuse? That's a thermal limiter. And what happens is if something happens and that fan's fouled and can't work, and this resistor is getting really, really hot, the heat from these coils will actually open that thermal fuse and it will kill all the power going to the blower. All right, and so on this one right here, you might notice that, uh, I mean, and, that, and the blower won't work at all typically on that kind. Look at how this is wired right here. You notice that this little wiper right here has got ground right here. See that ground? Okay, so whenever the ground is being fed into this, it goes, it actually is going to go through every one of those resistors, it's going to run the blower on low. Okay, it's also going to go down here so that this is on low, see that? But this is feeding the center of that, this, this ground is. All right, so when you go up here, now it's going through not as many resistors. When you go to that one, it's only going through one resistor. See, these are resistances. And then when it goes to high, it's bypassing all the resistors and it's running wide open. That's the way this one's wired up. Now, not all blower circuits are wired up the same way, but you might notice that it's the ground that's being switched. The power, whenever you turn on the ignition switch, this closes that relay, snaps it over here, and it sends power to the blower motor all the time, and the blower motor depends on all these resistors uh, going through that. When you turn this to off, there is no ground provided for the switch to even give the blower. The blower doesn't run that way, see, so you're better off. I mean, the way that fix, is fixed up is, is brilliantly designed and all that. Now, these blower resistors, because of the fact that blower motors take so much current to pull, you're liable to see problems with melting harness here. You're liable to see melting at this. If you're in a situation where, where I kick my blower motor and it, and it starts working when it won't work, and you know, get under there and look at the wires plugging into your blower resistor. Look at the wires plugging into your blower motor because you're probably going to find some melted if you've got one that. Somebody has to jerk on the wires to make the blower work. And they do make the pigtails for the blowers and for the blower resistors on most vehicles, you know, that are fairly contemporary. You might have trouble finding one if you go way back, you know, but, uh, you know, most vehicles that are 20 years old or less or even slightly more than that, you're going to be able to find that blower, blower connector and you'll be able to find the, uh, that, that blower because it pulls so much current has a tendency to, uh, sometimes it'll, terminals will start to oxidize, oxidize and they'll start to melt and then they'll drop more voltage and all that. But you notice every one of these resistors is designed to drop a certain amount of voltage. And so when you got it on low, the blower motor is only going to be running on 4 or 5 volts. And that's why it's running low. 
And when you put it up on the medium range, it's going to be running on six or seven. You put it up here, it's going to be running on eight or nine. Finally, it's running on a full system voltage when you put it up here on high. But you might notice that that ground is still coming from this switch right here. You see that? Uh, whenever it's off, away from that off position, you're going to be getting the ground through here. And it's going to go here through that little wiper, and it's going to do that. See? So anyway, the Lodestar 1800 clutch situation was an interesting thing. The, the company I worked for down in Texas had a Lodestar 1800 like this one right here. Now, <clears throat> it was a gas burner. That big old V8 engine in it, and I learned a lot working on that truck. But it was a strange setup. The way that the transmission was set up, it had a great big old five-speed transmission in there. It was a deuce and a half, even though it was a gas burner, and it had a flatbed on it. All right, so the engine had a five-speed transmission. It had a little short drive shaft. It had a four-speed auxiliary transmission. And so you basically had 20 forward gears. See, if you put this in the lowest speed and you shift it up through your five gears, you might be going 20 miles an hour when you were running wide open. Well, you could put this in one of different four. You didn't shift this one while you're going. You put it in gear and then you would drive it like this. Well, the problem with these people on the dock driving this thing is they kept burning out the dadgum clutch. And every time I turn around, I was having to pull that big old aggravating transmission out, put another clutch in it, because they were burning the darn thing out. And, and that was a big mess. Okay, so finally I got a brass button type clutch. It was kind of like this. This wasn't for that truck, but it was one similar to it. And I said, well, this brass button clutch, surely it will last longer than the one that's just got the standard uh, lining on it. Uh, the problem with that was uh, they abused the thing so bad with that clutch in there that it shattered the pressure plate and, and just messed it. I mean, it was a disaster. You wouldn't believe it. Um, it amazed me how those people, you know, somebody said they could tear up a steel ball with a feather. Uh, but anyway, that was a little deal. I, and, but incidentally, uh, there was a time whenever I, I re, we ordered, and it was cheaper to order it than it was to buy another truck. The cab and the wiring and all was in such bad shape on this thing. From International Harvester, I ordered a brand new cab, and I'm talking about this whole part here, and I ordered a tilt forward, you know, fiberglass part and all that, and I replaced the entire cab on that truck, and it made it like a brand new truck. It was really cool. It was a fun job. It was really interesting and fun to do. I really enjoyed that. All right. This guy right here I saw the other day, and I changed his license number because I don't like shining people's license number all over the place. But um, he was sitting there at the traffic signal checking something under his hood. Now, I don't know what he had to do under there, and I started to stop and ask him if he needed some help, but when I pulled up there and he saw me looking at him, uh, he closed the hood and he got back in his car. When the light changed, he drove away. So he must have had only a small problem or a problem, you know, the problem that was really quick and easy to fix, or this may be a minor adjustment. I don't know what it was, but if you ever find your Self sitting at a traffic signal like that. I was driving a raggedy, ratty old Miracar, Miracur XR4 Ti that had a lot of miles on it. And it was just a, tr you know, every now and then somebody give you a car to work on, it's just nothing but a piece of trash and it wouldn't even be worth 50 bucks to the junk man. But they want to keep driving the darn thing. And it had some kind of problem in it, like well, it was idling or something. And I cleaned the throttle body or whatever and I took a drive on it like a, a normal loop. And I was way over there by this little housing subdivision. And, uh, <laughs> Sitting there at a traffic signal, waiting for the, you know, I was going to circle around and go back to the dealership. I was through my test drive. And uh, sitting right there at that traffic signal, that thing started knocking and locked up on me. Ding! I said, oh, brother. So I was getting out there and I didn't have a cell phone in those days because that was before the days where I had a cell phone. I mean, some people had cell phones, but I didn't have one. It was in the 90s sometime. But anyhow, the lady that owned the dealership pulled out of there driving her $144,000 white coupe and uh, she asked me if I needed her to call somebody and I said sure it was a Mercedes she was driving and uh, she owned the Ford dealership and drove a Mercedes because she was from Germany you know but anyway she opened this little panel in the middle of her dash and there was a cell phone built into the dash and she dialed it with a pencil eraser <laughs> it was a speakerphone doggonest thing I'd ever seen at the time but, uh, all right, always notice the rust on the spark plugs. You know, if you see a spark plug that's got heavy rust on it, and the one that's next to it or the rest of them look like this, but one of them looks like that, that is a red flag. 
uh, this one here, or one sim very similar to it, it may not have been that exact one, came out of this uh, Chevrolet, this uh, 98 Chevrolet pickup truck, where it had cracked the head. And look at the rust on the valve. See, that same garbage rust on the valve was actually on the spark plug, and it turned out it's got a cracked head, and it was cracked in such a way that coolant was working its way in there. And this was one of those that had the old CSFI system on it. And he had gone to several other shops and they all wanted to replace all those CSFI injectors and all that because he had a misfire on that cylinder. And rather than actually tracking down, you know, what it was, they assumed it was, had something to do with the fuel injection spider because those gave a lot of trouble anyway. But anyway, we pulled the heads off, put him another head on there and all that kind of thing. You know, so. What do you see here? What's wrong with this picture? I see a Rivian sitting right here. I took this picture the other day right here in town and I did a double take when I went by the gas pump out there and I saw that Rivian sitting there. And I said, why is a fully electric $90,000 pickup sitting at the gas pump? And somebody said, well, maybe he was getting gas for a lawnmower. And I said, somebody with a $90,000 truck should be able to buy an electric lawnmower. They shouldn't have to buy gas for a lawnmower. And they ought to have an electric weed eater and they ought to have everything electric. They said, well, what if he was buying gas for a generator? And I said, well, he ought to have an electric generator, too. You know, that's a sort of a joke, but you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I thought that was a funny picture because here you've got this Rivian sitting here at the gas pumps. This right here was a non-communication boo-boo. You see how these terminals can get all screwed up? Those terminals aren't terribly durable anyway. Now, they usually, if you're the way they plug in, you're going to be plugging them in and pulling them straight back out because of the nature of that. But if somebody's ever jacked around with one of those terminals and rammed a test light up in there and it winds up not being able to make a good connection to your scan tool, you'll have a non-communication issue with, some, with one of your networks. And this one here was one of the networks wasn't communicating real good. And when I got to investigating it, the first place, the easiest place to look right quick is just unplug your scan tool, get a bright light, maybe take a picture of this thing with your cell phone and zoom in on it. Because you can find out a lot more like that sometimes than you can looking at it with your naked eye. Because it's a static image that you can just, you know, slowly look at. And that's what we wound up with on this one. And I was able to get in there with a little pick and bend that back up so that it was more like these right here. And I regained my communication on that. That's always just a word for the wise. One day I worked on this Ford Ranger that wouldn't communicate with nothing when I plugged into it. And this was, uh, there was a lot of, it was kind of a new thing, this connector under the dash. And the guy that had owned the truck didn't know what that connector was for. Figured since he wasn't using it, it wasn't needed. And he just cut the wires loose from it and used them to power his radio. They figured, well, this ain't going nowhere anyway, so I'll just cut the wires. And imagine how ridiculous that is. Incidentally, this connector here was one of the things that was covered under the original 80,000 mile uh, emission warranty, along with the catalytic converter, the check engine light, the engine controller, and that kind of thing. You know. All right. This right here was a picture I took of a cutaway engine when I was at the Power Stroke Rally. A lot of times we don't even think about how close those pistons come to the cylinder head on a diesel. Now, <coughs> granted there's a bowl in the top of that piston that turns out to be your combustion chamber, but that piston, I was talking to an engineer, he says when that piston heats up, when everything's heated up and expanded, you know, 40 thousandths of an inch here winds up being like six or seven thousandths of an inch I mean, it almost hitting that head every time it comes up there. It barely stops on the way uh, up there. So uh, I thought that was just an interesting thing. On your uh, Deutsch engines, the air-cooled ones, where you've got, you know, the, the jugs and each put, uh, cylinder's got its own cylinder head. Now what you're supposed to do is put a blob of solder in there because you had to adjust the clearance. You took that blob of solder and you put it in there and you bar the engine over and it squishes the solder. And then whenever you mic the solder, you find out, you know, what you need to do to, where you need, to, how you need to reshim it to get it at the, at the 40 thousandths clearance or whatever the spec is. Volkswagen and Rabbits had various different gasket thicknesses on their diesels, and they had notches that you could see. When you look down in there, you'd see how many notches were on the gasket, and you were supposed to put one back in there with the same number of notches. And that was, that was supposed to, you know, because of the machining of the head and the uh, block and all that, that would basically give you the right kind of clearance for that. Uh, for that diesel and all. Now, this was one of the things I ran into that just annoyed the ever-loving crap out of me on a trainer vehicle I had. It got to where sometimes it wouldn't start because these little terminals here wore out to the point to where if you pulled on the, the terminal and wiggled it a little bit, 
<clears throat> it would basically give you spark and the engine would start up and all that. Uh, but it was a constant issue working with that. And so I started trying to find another one of these connectors. And back when I was looking for one, no matter where I looked, um, could not find a replacement connector. But the later models that came after this uh, little, this was a Chrysler Neon. But that thing was, uh, the later ones had a, a blade type terminal and a blade type connector. So if you replace the coil and the connector, you know, hook your wires up, right, obviously, uh, then you can solve that problem. I did something vaguely similar to that one time when this lady come in and she was traveling. It was a Friday afternoon. She was driving a Jeep Cherokee and the headlight switch had burned out, you know, like they do sometimes just because of the similar reason why the blower, uh, you know, cooks its circuits and messes things up. So the um, headlight switch had burned out and she had no headlights. So whenever I got on there and looked at the headlight switch, saw it was all melted and everything, I said, oh man, this is a mess. And so we were a Jeep dealer, but they did not have a uh, ignition, I mean, a headlight switch or the pigtail to go with it. But they did have a Ford headlight switch and the Ford pigtail to go with it. And it was so similar as far as the configuration of how it went into the dash and the way the knob went in and all that. You know the ones I'm talking about where you push the knob on the flat part of the switch and you just, you know, push the button on the flat part of the switch, pull the knob out. Um, I actually took uh, the pigtail from the Ford and I figured out the wiring configuration and I rewired, I uh, upgraded that Jeep uh, Cherokee with a Ford headlight switch and sitting in the uh, truck you couldn't tell that it wasn't factory, you know. Now if somebody ever goes to put a headlight switch back on there, uh, for you know years down the road they may have run into a big problem now, I don't remember it seems to me like I might have even put a sticker on the side of that headlight switch telling the next mechanic where the headlight you know what the headlight switch was originally supposed to fit so that they would be able to fix the headlights again next time although the vehicle probably gone now and all that but anyways if if the component will do the same job and you can do the repair in such a way that where it's not dangerous and won't give trouble, there's no reason not to go ahead and do that. Um, I had a lot of fun that one time this uh, conversion van come in there and it had all of these switches up here, you know, above where the driver was where he's supposed to turn it off and on various different things, that, you know, in his conversion van stuff and all. And some of those switches had burned out and fell apart and all that kind of thing. He wanted to know if we could fix that. And I bought a, a, a project box from the uh, Radio Shack and I used it as a sort of a little panel that I put up there. It was flush and it looked real good and I put I put relays in there and I put little uh, those little red um, switches um, so that they would energize the relay. The relay would carry the circuit of the lights and crap in the back or whatever they was turning on. And also I put a little green LED so that whenever they push that button and the relay was energized, they'd be able to see that that green LED lit up. I just sent me a barrel of fun building that. <laughs> and they were tickled pink because it was a customized repair that looked really, really good. And that was one of the things that I really enjoyed doing. Now, this was something I ran into with the students over and over and over again. I would get out here and I'd tell them all about this. You know, here's your EGR valve. This is the fuel pressure regulator. And I would say, I'd go over and open the hood and I'd have them identify components. I'd say, okay, show me the EGR valve. And they would point to the fuel pressure regulator. They would see a diaphragm with a rubber hose going to it, and they would assume that just because it was a diaphragm with a rubber hose, without even paying attention to the fact that it was on a fuel rail, you know, they would say, that's the EGR valve. And I'd say, Argh. you know, I said, don't tell me that that's an EGR valve when it's on the fuel rail. That is the EGR valve over there. Now, this is the fuel pulsation damper. And it's basically supposed to make, keep the injector from being so noisy, click, 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 you know, so you don't hear those as much. And see, a lot of them will have a fuel pressure regulator and that, but in some cases this kind of acts like a fuel pulsation damper, but not always. It can have both of them on it uh, and all that. So that's just, that's one of the things that I had, you know, I'd, I'd say, I want to tell them, show me the idle speed control, show me this, show me the canister, show me the canister purge valve, all that stuff, and just have them, you know, show me the map center, whatever. I would have them point out various different components so that they could, uh, and, and on emissions, um, one of the times that I uh, would give these emission finals that I had lots and lots and lots of old emission components, and I would lay them out on a big bench over there in the electronics lab, 
and I would put numbers on all these components, and I would give them a piece of paper. I said, you identify every one of these components. I'd even let them sit around the table together, because there would be a probably 40 or 50 components, and they'd have to identify each and every one of them. And uh, that was a really good uh, experience, because if somebody can just glance at a part and tell you what it is, that person's more knowledgeable than somebody who's just saying, I see a part, but I don't know what it is, you know. Particularly if it's under the vehicle. I'd say, show me the throttle position sensor, show me the, you know, whatever. Uh, so, now this is a homemade EGR passage cleaning tool. Oh, look, fuel pressure regulator. That is not the EGR rail. Ha, ha, ha. But anyway, I took a cable off of an old, it was an old park brake cable that had this threaded end on it. And I cut it off and I whiskered out the ends of it. And I could go at an angle down in there and I could get, uh, you know, put some uh, spray in there and just work my way through that uh, and clear out that clogged EGR uh, port down in there. I've cleaned several of them out like that on some of the GM cars. And, uh, and on some of the Fords I do it too, you know, because they like to crud that thing up. Alright, the ignition lock cylinders can throw you for a loop. I have seen this on Chevys, Fords, Jeeps, Saturns, and others. What happens is somebody's fat, dumb, and happy, like the guy that was uh, the air conditioner instructor. This guy, he goes to the, to the gas station. Uh, with a bunch of his students in the 15 passenger Chevy van and he called me and he goes hey this key this lock cylinder won't turn I said what do you mean a lock cylinder he said it just won't turn it's like I got the wrong key or something and so they you know I said well we're going to get it towed in so they towed it in and the lock cylinder had just you know, been fouled up internally where the the key that fit the vehicle wouldn't work <clears throat> so you can got a couple of choices you can get the you well there was at the time you could buy a lock cylinder with all the pieces that had all of the little, you know, springs and uh, tumblers and everything in there. And you could build another one to fit that same key, which I did that a lot. That was kind of fun. Or you could just buy a lock cylinder from the parts store. And if you buy a lock cylinder from the parts store, you just pop it in there. Now you're going to have a, you know, you, you'll have a different key for the door than you do for the lock. I never have it like that. I kind of like to keep everything configured like it was in factory if I could. Uh, but the first time I ever ran into this, was on a, uh, and to get the lock cylinder out of there, you got to drill it out. You know, I mean, and, and you better have a good drill and you better have some good bits. And but you got to be able to turn that thing to the to the own position to release it to pull that old uh, old thing out. And I had a Thunderbird one time that came. The first time I ever saw one of those back in the 80s. And uh, the lady came in there and she said, all of a sudden the key just wouldn't work anymore. And so I was like, yeah, that's, you got issues with that. And so I, I drilled it out. Replace it, you know, you put a big cloth on the floor so all of the filings that are coming out of there, you got to roll those up, you're not even messing the car. Um, but I saw it on a Saturn, a Saturn we had one time. We could not get a lock cylinder for that Saturn without sending the owner with their identification and their uh, title to the car with their name on it to the dealership in Montgomery. And they had to show them all of that before they could give them a lock cylinder for us to put in their car. Now that is a coming thing. Uh, with a lot of them, a lot of people have figured out that if you've got a lock cylinder that you're buying for a car, you may be stealing the dadgum car. So they got to make sure that they have crossed their T's and dotted their I's and that you're not a car thief, uh, you know, trying to get a key to fit a car that you've stolen or something. And so, but that, the Saturn was the first one. And I was thinking at the time, who in the world would steal a dadgum Saturn anyway, you know? But, I mean, I think there was, back in 1995, it was the most stolen car in America, but since and before then, <laughs> not anymore. There's still a lot of Saturns running around out there. Anyway, this was actually a Ford Focus. And what you'd have to do on that one was, you know, make an X on it. So you're drilling right in the middle, drill in there, you know, and you got to get a little piece out that, you know, little square pieces keeping it from turning. Anyway, you get that. Now, I have taken my uh, <clears throat> pliers before on these older real robust ones like I told that story about that uh, I got to, I drew this ticket on a bucket truck and they said go out there and they say that they think the ignition switch might be bad on this bucket truck but uh, it won't start and so I said okay that's interesting they think the ignition switch might be bad so I I walked out there and I saw this big old white bucket truck sitting there and I said oh well that must be it so I get in there stuck the key in there and um, it wouldn't turn I said, oh yeah I've seen this this is not an ignition switch it's a lock cylinder issue so I grabbed it with my pliers like that, except that's backwards. I grabbed it the other way and turned it and crunched that thing over into the start position, fired it up, pulled it into the shop. I was changing out the lock cylinder whenever the maintenance man came up and said, what are you doing with our bucket truck? I said, wait a minute, I didn't know we had a bucket truck. He said, yeah, we just got it yesterday. 
and I looked at my thing and I was supposed to be working on one that was for P River Electric and that was what my tag said and they had another bucket truck out there and it had a problem of some other kind it wasn't I don't know if it's ignition switch or what it was but it wasn't anything related to the key but I had taken their key stuck it in our bucket truck it wouldn't do it I forced it over and <laughs> that was just a big mess all the way around that's what happens when you don't look at the key tag and compare it to what's hanging from the mirror, right? Uh, but anyway, that's uh, does this guy right here use the wrong starter shim? There was the thickest starter shim on a Chevy starter I'd ever seen. It must have been an uh, eighth of an inch thick. I've never seen one that thick. And when a guy changed out the starter, it had that it, real thick shim on it, and he just used the same thick shim, and it would barely even touch the teeth, and it wound up, you know, screwing up the teeth on the starter. Uh, I mean on the flywheel, so we had to pull the transmission for the flywheel in that one because and when we put it up with no shim it was perfect. I mean it just the guy that put it on there was trying to do a good job, but you know, he basically didn't understand the, the shimming aspect of the starter. Now I will tell you on these GM starters, if you want them to, to go a little deeper, you can put a washer out here under the bolt, between the bolt and the starter, and it will tilt the starter in and make it go in a little farther. If it's in too far, you can uh, put move the washer to here and it'll move it out. So you don't always have to use shims. If you're slick you can use you know little flat washers between the starter and here to adjust those in and out. Now this right here was a way when I used regulated air to find a leaky injector on a uh, Lexus SC300. And uh, I told that story one time before but I used a cylinder leakage tester and I regulated it to about 40 psi which is what the fuel was supposed to be. See I had that one uh, I put 40 in there. Well, 10, 20, 30. I put about 30 in there on that apparently. But I hooked up to it with a special adapter which replaced the little banjo bolt up in there. And so I dialed this in so that I was seeing 30 or 40 pounds of air pressure right there going into the entire fuel line going all the way to the front. And I could hear this one was blowing a lot of a black uh, smoke and gas mist out in the back when it was running. And he'd spent about $4,000 on it putting parts on it itself and taking it to shops. So when we uh, did that, we heard an injector just hissing into the intake. And whenever I went to uh, unplugging the wires from the injectors, when I unplugged a certain one of them, it stopped hissing. So I said, that injector is electrically open. And so I went to the engine controller, and I unplugged the engine controller, and that wide open injector was not wide open anymore. So we had a problem inside the engine controller. I pulled the engine controller off, sent it off to A1 Cardone, and they rebuilt it for like $400. Now, when you send one off to get it rebuilt, they want to know why they're rebuilding it, right? So when I sent it off, they found the, the shorted injector driver, and they replaced that in there and put it back together. Boom, he was good to go, you know, that was all it took. But using that air, I had never seen anybody do that before, but I just reasoned out that, hey, why not? You know, let's see, do that. And when you hear it in the intake, when you've got it full of air instead of fuel, it's going to go, pssst, you can hear it hissing into the intake, and you know that's the one that's squirting all the gas in there. Now, if I had unplugged the, the wire connector and it was still hissing, I know it was an injector problem. You understand what I'm saying? But I had to make sure that it wasn't a, uh, the wire wasn't shorted to ground on that one injector lead coming from the engine controller, too. That's why I unplugged the engine controller, because if it had kept hissing then, then I would know that it was a wire harness short uh, touching ground on the driver's side of the injector, so on and so forth. Connector faults are an issue. You see them pushed back like that one there. That was on a Dodge truck that the uh, fuel gauge or the pump or something wouldn't work right. I can't remember what the deal was. That looked like a pump because these two heavier wires. It would start sometimes, sometimes it wouldn't. Uh, this right here was going to the fuel pump on a Pontiac Montana, like a 01 model. And uh, that was one that I got uh, smacked around whenever we checked it didn't have a ground at the test light going back to the a pump and I kicked the gas tank and the light came on. We assumed it was a pump, but we saw a brand new pump in there. We got to looking, and this is right up in the wheel well where water splashes on it and it corroded it. And we had to replace that connector that was from in the body and that connector of the harness. We took care of all of that and cleaned that all up. This was out of a Crown Victoria. The transmission wouldn't shift right because that one burned out terminal right there on that little, this is where you plug the wires into the transmission. This is an assembly you can buy. And uh, the guy from the city shop brought that over and showed it to me. And he said, that thing, that transmission beat us up something terrible. So we realized that there was an electrical problem. It was throwing codes and everything else, too. This was a Chevy pickup that has that little junction block under the side on the back. 
and this guy came in with tail light problems and it turned out that this junction block one of the terminals that broke off of that and this was just a big mess and so I was telling him you're going to need a junction block and doing that unless you wanted to patch the wires up or all that but I always wanted to look factory when I got done so I told him he needed that pigtail and junction block and at the time he decided not to have it done <clears throat> this is what happens when you got a lot of students that are actually checking uh, wire harnesses and stuff on a trainer vehicle they ram their test probes down in there and destroy the, ter the terminal so that you've always got an ABS sensor code and all that so if you Look at this. Sometimes you can tell this is a pin fit issue like I was talking before. This is pin corrosion issue. This is a pin push back issue. This is a pin burnout issue. And that's another pin corrosion issue that doesn't quite look like that one. But it still broke that pin off right there. And it's stuck up in here. You know, so anyway. So anybody that builds herself a shop and fixes nothing but power windows would probably get more work than they think they would. Because every time you turn around you're seeing somebody with a power window that don't work. Both of the windows on this late model Kia were taped up with duct tape. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, and it seemed like, you know, I don't know how much it cost to fix those windows. I know on some of the GM cars back in the day, when those windows would go bad, if you took it to the dealer, they wanted $400 per window to fix the windows. And sometimes, you know, they would go bad one after another. But like I say, we fixed a lot of power windows. Uh, my grandson uh, has got a 09 Honda Element, and uh, his power window... The driver's side and then the passenger side went bad, and he fixed those himself. My uh, youngest son walked him through the, the fix, and he's like 17, My grand, you know, you know, one of my grandsons. He's not my oldest grandson, but he's old enough to fix his own dad gun power window. Now, this one right here is these fragile flues. This was on a Hyundai Sonata uh, that was a trainer vehicle, and one of the students, and this wasn't that long ago, was pulling the, the radiator fan out of it as an exercise, and he managed to dig it into that flue right there and start it spraying. Uh, that's not good. And these flues are really fragile on these radiators and, and also on uh, uh, air conditioner condensers and stuff like that. They can be really, really bad. You know. All right. This was the last one, of the last slide. This guy was talking about this, uh, this uh, Chrysler 3.0. The customer had put a belt on and said it would crank forward and backwards only about a half an inch. And so he tore it down to inspect it and it turned out uh, that he tried to remove the belt and couldn't because the guy had super glued the belt to the crank cam and idler pulleys. Why and what were they thinking about when they did that? The fact that they were smart enough to put a belt on it but didn't know any better than to super glue it, I guess they thought it didn't move. That's just the weirdest thing I've ever heard. So anyway, he cut it off and spent two hours cleaning the pulleys and then he put a new belt on it. <laughs> Got him on his way. Anyway, you have a week that's a good one, productive, and get a lot of stuff done and I'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you.